Eucharist, I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we too are his offspring. <clears throat> Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We read Psalm 66 responsibly. Bless our God, you peoples. Let the sound of praise be heard. Our God has kept us among the living and has not allowed our feet to slip. For you, O oh God, have tested us. You have tried us just as silver is tried. You brought us in through the net and laid heavy burdens upon our backs. You let people ride over our heads. And we went through fire and water but you brought us out into a place of refreshment. I will enter your house with burnt offerings and will pay you my vows. Those that I promised with my lips and spoke with my mouth when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt offerings of fatlings with the smoke of rams. I will give you oxen and goats. Come and listen, all you who believe, and I will tell you what God has done for me. I called out to God with my mouth and praised the Lord with my tongue. If I had cherished evil in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. But in truth, God has heard me and has attended to the sound of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not rejected my prayer, not nor withheld unfailing love from me. <clears throat> Our second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3. Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated, but in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct, conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism which this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand in body or spirit for our gospel. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. 
Alleluia, Alleluia. This is the Holy Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have kept my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to each of you from God who loves you, from Jesus who saves you, and from the Spirit who advocates for you. For you. Amen. In that reading from John that we just heard, Jesus offered comfort and hope to his dearest friends before he would be leaving them. He would leave them, but he would not leave them orphaned or abandoned. They were sad, they were confused. I'm pretty sure, but they would not be orphaned or abandoned by Jesus. It is a great message for the Church of Christ in any age that Jesus will not abandon you or orphan you. That is a promise from the Lord. What Jesus was trying to explain to them is that the Spirit would be with them, truly God with them. Emmanuel, from all of those Advent and Christmas hymns, God with them, not in person as Jesus, but in spirit. Jesus had to leave them. In his own words, he needed to go and be with the Father, but his presence and his power His love and his work would continue in their lives through the Spirit. Kind of confusing, huh? It is a great mystery of faith. We worship a triune God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. We see that in our lives, but it is something that's hard to wrap our minds and our thoughts around. The presence of the Spirit is how God has worked in the physical world since the beginning of all time, literally since creation, since God formed all that is. And we hear in that first part of Scripture, that God created heavens and the earth, and the Spirit moved. The Spirit moved in creation. That Spirit brings God's creating and redeeming presence into the physical world. That spiritual presence of the one Jesus called Father was in Jesus, and in the physical world, and in all who believe. In that short passage from John that we heard, Jesus used a very special word to describe the work of the Spirit. And it's a word that I want to spend a few moments focusing on with you today. 
because it's a word that reveals God's purpose and power to us. The purpose and power of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, that power is contained in this simple word that Jesus used. Some of you probably grew up reading the King James Version of Scripture. Um, it's still a beautiful translation and surprisingly accurate. But in the original King James Version, this word that Jesus used was not translated from Greek. See if it rings a bell. The word is paraclete. Paraclete. The Greek form is parakletos. It means, well, let me read you what the original King James said. Jesus said in that old English, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another paraclete that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for, ye, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. As the King James Version was reprinted, and more and more people in English started reading the scriptures all those years back, that word paraclete was replaced with comforter. Comforter. So Jesus promised his disciples not to leave them comfortless, that he would come with comfort. Paraclete is a word that Jesus introduced to his friends, and he did it at a particular time in his life. During that final blessing of his disciples, he did the Lord's Supper, he washed their feet, he gave them the great commandment, and he prayed for them and taught them at length in John's Gospel. And he introduced this word paraclete that only appears in John's writings and appears four out of five times in the passage that we just heard. Paraclete gives his people, his dear friends, an understanding of the work that he was doing. It means literally called to one side. Called to one side or called forth to be alongside with. <laughs> That's a little bit heavy with prepositions, called to one's side. Think, think the way we hear that phrase in English, para, parallel, right? I look out on these pews and they are all parallel. They are side by side. Paralegal, paraprofessional, working alongside, working with, called to be with. Kletos is the other half of that word, and that means called forth or invited or appointed, appointed to be with. So when Bible translators started to translate it, and they kind of needed to because there's not really, I mean, we, we don't speak like that, and we need the translations, it was usually translated comforter or in our passage today and in many modern translations, advocate, advocate, somebody called to be alongside who can offer special comfort or advocacy. Both of those words, advocate and comforter, get to the heart of Christ's redeeming work on behalf of God's people. Both of those words help Christ's followers understand his work and it helps them understand his work even after he ascends and leaves them. The best translation in my mind is advocate. That word shades all of Christ's redeeming work in a legal setting. In a legal setting. It is a legal word. 
I believe that when we can hear how the Holy Spirit serves this legal purpose for us, then we can more deeply take to heart what God is doing for us in Christ's redeeming work. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him because he abides with you. I am coming to you. I am not leaving you orphaned. Jesus said these things to his disciples while he was still with them. But after he leaves them and ascends to heaven, the Holy Spirit, who the Father sent in his name, will teach them, reveal everything to them, and remind them of all that Jesus said. Jesus said to them, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Jesus promised that they would have an advocate, someone who would be called by their side, especially in times of trouble, especially in times when they were in trouble or feared trouble. Paraclete is a legal term. Advocate is a legal term. It is someone who advocates for another who has been accused. That's how Jesus wanted the disciples to hear about the Holy Spirit. Now, most of you have probably watched movies or TV shows or read books about courtroom dramas. You can't really watch primetime television most nights and not see something. I think Law and Order is on sometime on cable every single moment of the day. Maybe some of you have had experience in a courtroom. Probably not as the accused. At least I won't put anyone on the spot. But maybe some of you have had that experience. What a comfort it is when you are faced with charges to have an advocate, somebody who speaks on your behalf, an advocate, somebody who argues on your behalf, an advocate, someone who will fight on your behalf for your rights, for justice, and appeal for mercy. What a comfort it is for those accused to have an advocate. Now, later, as the Apostle Paul helped new Christians understand how it works with God, he described how Moses gave the law, but Christ brought mercy and righteousness. There's the contrast. Moses, the giver of the law, a law which accuses us, Christ, the giver of righteousness, who advocates for us, who brings us representation, who speaks for us, who on our behalf makes appeals under that law. Martin Luther made a great distinction between law and gospel but said all scripture form, uh, functions as both law and gospel, simultaneously calling us to repentance and coming in with good news to save us, to save us. All people, Paul wrote, live under God's law. The law accuses us. And all people also live under Jesus, the risen Savior who makes us righteous. Simply stated, Christ's redeeming work is carried out in our lives and in our world by the advocate, the advocate, the spirit of truth who animates and inspires, calls us, gathers and enlightens us. The one who advocates for us, us whom the law accuses, 
the one who comes alongside of us in our moment of trial for justice, to make the case on our behalf. We are not ever abandoned to the law, abandoned to a sentence, abandoned even to a tomb of death, but we always have an advocate who advocates for us, with us, alongside us, who raises us to life, even when we are under sentence. We are never, ever abandoned to the law. Any charge against us will be met by an advocate, the advocate. Are your hearts troubled? Then you have an advocate. If you're worried about something, you have a heavenly advocate to comfort you, to be alongside you. Are you scared? You have an advocate. That's the promise of Jesus. My peace I give to you, he says, in the midst of promising an advocate. You will not be orphaned. I am coming to you to advocate for you. If you're burdened, if you're carrying a load of cares, you have an advocate. Jesus lives. The Spirit of Christ lives in this world in each of you to advocate for you. He advocates for your life. The challenge, I think, for us as a church, as people of God, as baptized members of the body of Christ, is to trust that advocacy, to receive it, in some ways to keep our mouths shut and let our advocate speak for us. But the challenge is also that as that advocate lives in us, that advocate also lives through us. You see, the body of Christ is in this world living not just for me or for you, but for all. And the true transformation and the power of Jesus describing the Spirit's work as an advocacy work is that we are empowered to advocate for one another to walk alongside and be with each other. That can make all of the difference, friends. That can make all of the difference. What an honor, what a privilege, what a hard burden sometimes. But you are not orphaned, you are not alone. Jesus said, I am coming to you to advocate for you and advocate through you. I don't know what that looks like precisely in each of your lives. Many of you were here yesterday for Catherine's funeral. Thank you for coming back again the next day for more church. <laughs> but part of that work, that advocate work that you do, for others, is bearing grief, carrying loads, and speaking promise, living promise, into their lives. Trust me, your presence here yesterday mattered. At a moment of grief and a moment of death, your advocacy, by being here and standing for life, joining them in Christian fellowship so that they do not feel orphaned. Your presence matters. And that same presence will matter wherever you carry it, in all that you do, and in all that we bring. We offer ourselves, but more importantly, we offer the Spirit who calls us to be alongside Thanks be to God.
Thanks be to God.